Jose Javier Rodriguez, State Senator, I have the honor of representing Miami in the Florida Legislature. I am perfectly comfortable. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I would say this if Brandis were still here, but I can take the heat. It does not, I mean, uh, so I'm gonna keep my jacket on, it's fine with me. Uh, while we're talking about attire, I apologize for doing this, but it is actually true. This is the third legislative session. Uh, that I do wear these during the, my legislative work at the Capitol. These are giant uh, rubber rain boots. It is absurd that le a state legislator, elect a constitutionally elected officer, has to go around the Capitol wearing these, but I do do that uh, because of uh, climate. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about a couple topics, uh, climate, tax fairness, and uh, um, the earned income tax credit. So if I miss one of them, somebody will shout out and remind me. But before I do, I, I did want to mention one thing that uh, it, it's sort of just an interesting note, something that is among the least controversial things that we're working on in the legislature is the topic of bundling of constitutional amendments, right? Um, we have these two constitutional revision structures. One is the CRC. The other one is the Tax and Budget Reform Commission, which we will see in 2028. Uh, there is a proposal moving through to actually two proposals, which is relevant. Uh, to uh, propose to the voters, hey, can we impose a single subject limitation on them, right, to avoid bundling. Uh, that is a little bit at odds with the idea of a revision commission, but given what we saw in 2018, frankly, the, the, the voters are demanding it and, and they should have it. Funny enough, in the House, they took both revision commission proposals and put them in the same uh, joint resolution. Anybody see a problem with that? Okay, it's anti-bundling, so we separate them in the Senate. So hopefully we'll be able to educate our House members uh, this time around. Uh, but I did want to talk about climate. So climate is a topic that affects every other topic, right? Climate is a social justice issue. It is a local economic issue. It is a state economic issue. It's an issue of public health. And I'll tell you where we have begun to finally see movement here in the state of Florida. Uh, my big mantra, I don't think that it is a uh, shock to anybody here, is that we've had inaction at the state level uh, when it comes to climate. That is not to say that a lot of state agencies have not been for a long time doing very good work related to the impacts of climate, uh, but we need to step into the arena in a much more, uh, much stronger way uh, on all areas uh, to, frankly, protect uh, the people of Florida. So where we've had movement initially, last year we, we got a bill out of the, uh, two Senate committees unanimously, uh, that is relatively simple. It says if you're going to draw down state dollars for state uh, for infrastructure in the coastal building zone, you have to do a sea level impact projection analysis, right? Uh, included in that is that Department of Environmental Protection would help define what that analysis looks like. So what is the consequence of this? State agencies, local governments that are spending taxpayer dollars in the coastal zone are going to have to do something shocking, which is called planning, right? Which is looking at, hey, we're going to look at projections and see if the, if the, the plans we have are the best uh, way to protect taxpayer dollars, right? And so the initial movement we've had on climate is really fiscal because my message, and I think what helped kind of break through a little bit uh, for those of us working on this topic, is that credit markets are watching us. Reinsurance is watching us do nothing. Pardon my, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to happen. Sorry for freaking out. <laughs> do nothing. That's what I meant to do. Part of it. So, and it, it, it is unbelievably frustrating, and we've already seen consequences happening last year. Um, so, uh, the, the part of my message to you all, right, to the extent that we can keep that message going, right, again, for me, climate is, is a topic of social justice, it's a topic of public health. It's a topic of many things, but when we're talking about it as a topic of fiscal responsibility and an economic topic, uh, we are making progress in the Florida legislature, and I want to kind of invite you to join us in that effort. Uh, another topic that, that, that I, I want to address, uh, so, you know, it's funny. So, I think it's since 1971, we've had no personal income tax in our Constitution. Who is not aware of that? Nobody, right? So I don't know how many state of the state addresses I hear where we 
stand and you know give a, a you know an ovation to the fact of that it's in our constitution and that's it's going to stay that way. So it's going to stay that way. Um, but when we talk about our corporate income tax, one of the things that I've been working on and many others have, uh, to some with with frankly, I'll be perfectly honest, with very little success in this legislative environment is about fairness, right? So one of the topics that I have, one of the bills that I have filed most years in the Florida House and Senate uh, relates to the Water's Edge reporting. Uh, is the co it, it combined reporting, it's, it's a lot of different things. And what it, what it deals with is, you know, the, the, the tax avoidance strategies that we, frankly, in Florida have not followed the lead of other states in closing uh, some of these loopholes. And how many of you all have uh, seen the, this series of articles uh, by the Orlando Sentinel? Jason Garcia is the lead reporter. Uh, yeah, a lot of you have seen those. Uh, I, I think that's excellent reporting, uh, helping to paint the picture of what, in my view, has been going on. And it's not simply the fact of tax avoidance, meaning that we have fewer resources to pay for the things that we need to do. Uh, we're fighting for teacher raises. We're trying to do a whole range of things that are sensible. Uh, you know, Senator Brandis talks about corrections. But one of the main things with the particular reform that I'm talking about and the tax avoidance scheme that I'm describing is it has to do with uh, entities that are not simply Florida businesses that can move assets and liabilities between jurisdictions, right, between here and another state, between here and another country. Uh, and can make themselves appear more poor at tax time here in Florida than they really are. Um, so from, from 2015, at least a decade and a half going back in time, the Revenue Estimating Conference told us how much revenue we're likely to generate if we close this loophole. And it was, and it was approaching $500 million a year. Um, 2015, however, was also the first year where in the House Finance and Tax Committee, we started to seriously vet this as an idea and it hadn't been vetted in 10 years. And the, you know, the, when it was vetted 10 years prior, it was a Republican uh, who was bringing forward the idea, not a Democrat, right? Uh, but all of a sudden, 10 years later, it had been, it, it, it had been made a, a partisan issue. But all of a sudden, the Revenue Estimating Conference uh, for 2016 and since has been indeterminate, right? Yeah. So we can't go out and say, hey, we're gonna generate half a million dollars from this for our public education system, uh, but we're pretty confident that, that, that making our tax system fairer for Florida-based businesses uh, is A, fairer, right? It relieves burdens on anyone, any, uh, you know, any individual taxpayer, particularly those based in Florida that cannot take advantage of these schemes. Uh, but also, to the extent that uh, it relieves the, the necessity of property taxes and other types of taxes that we all bear, uh, it makes it more fair, right? So when we make our tax base more fair, when everybody's paying their fair share, we can talk about tax relief that's broad-based, right? Uh, and I think that's part of why, you know, part of why I'm hoping we're gaining momentum. Last topic I'll, I'll mention, earned income tax credit. Why do I mention that? in a state where we're never gonna have a personal income tax. So interestingly, for about six or seven years, we've been kicking around the idea, it's not a partisan idea, uh, about trying to figure out how can we have the equivalent of an earned in income tax credit here in the state of Florida. So every year in Florida, uh, or actually I think the last tax year, we had $5 billion uh, of tax dollars come back to our state by low-income working Floridians applying for their income tax credit and getting their tax dollars back. That's great. We left a, million, a billion dollars on the table. Did I say a million or billion? Five billion. Did I say that five billion? Yeah, okay, gotcha, good. So, yeah, 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 it's funny. Yes, uh, a billion dollars though we left on the table, right? So we say nothing else, you know, that, that, that's, that's on us to try to make sure we bring the, those dollars back to our communities. But one of the mechanisms that we we were kicking around was, listen, low-income Floridians pay federal income taxes, but if you live here in Florida, you pay gas taxes, you pay potentially property taxes, you definitely pay sales taxes, you pay all kinds of state fees, right? And because of our tax structure, we tend to be among the most regressive in the country. And one way to, 
one way to try to alleviate that is let's try to figure out if we could do a, a rebate for working families. Uh, and so this year in the, in the Senate um, Commerce Committee, we had a workshop and we came up with a working model. It's not perfect, uh, but what it would do is, it, the, the model, and I filed it with Representative uh, Fernandez, is that it would, it would provide a rebate to those families who've already drawn down their earned income tax credit and say, hey, we'll kick in 10%, right? 10% recognizing that if you file the Florida return and you lived here for 12 months, there's no way you didn't pay into the system that amount of sales taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So if the average earned income tax, if the, if the average amount of return or income, earned income tax credit is about $2,500 uh, $2, for a family, uh, it averages out to about $250 a family uh, who would apply for this program. Uh, part, of the problem, part of the things we have to work out operationally, and we're working with Department of Revenue and others, is it, so far there is not a me mechanism to make it automatic, right? So that a taxpayer, uh, a low-income taxpayer who uh, you know, sends in their federal return, we can't automatically piggyback on that. You know, they, we have to wait until that, you know, until that uh, return comes back and have them apply. But the reason why this is so, in, uh, why I think it's so important um, is you know, we're, all the things that we talk about doing, uh, tax fairness uh, or, or tax relief for working families, they're very indirect, right? The, sales tax holidays, things like that. Uh, and this is among the most direct things that we could do to provide uh, tax relief for everyday working families. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to continue working on this idea because uh, there aren't really any other good ones. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, any discussions anybody's willing to have about the regressivity of our tax code. It's a real thing, right? Low income Floridians, uh, as a percentage of their income, pay a lot more in taxes uh, than, than they do in most other states. Very few other states are as regressive as ours, and I'm trying to figure out creative ways for us to undo that. So anyway, look, look forward to hearing from you all and uh, to continuing the dialogue. I appreciate you all uh, uh, having me join you.